it is I, the Dalek Emperor, and welcome back to another Dalek cast. We have a lot of questions today, viewers. A first comes from, well, all, well, most of them come from Psych, apparently. The first is, um, congrats to 200 Dalek cast milestone. Thank you, um, Psychic, for mentioning that, yes, we are at 200 Dalek cast so far, so thank you for the sticking around and answering these lovely questions. Second, do you see Zero Zia as a threat? Well, I uh, no. No, I do not see it as a threat yet. But so long as you don't attack me or interfere with my plans, then if, if you do attack, though, I will see you as a threat and I will have no choice but to exterminate you and your, inf your pitiful betr betraying empire. Yes. Third, what is your opinion on Borat? Borat? You mean that movie? Oh dear. Oh yes. I don't think I like that movie. It's actually quite terrible, actually. It's got a lot of controversy surrounding it. And uh, I, I, I don't know why, um, why Borat does weird and offensive things. Uh, yeah, there, there, there was a lot of penis gags and all, all that stuff. Uh, I don't think I'd want to watch it again, no. And the sequel just made him think a lot worse. Oh, video game. Um, Psycho suggested me a video game called Victoria 3, an epic historical game made by Paradox, where where you play as any nation in Victorian in uh, in the Victorian era and beyond. Yes, I will most definitely play that. So if you could send me the link, uh, Psycho, that would be fine. I'll 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 speak to you on Discord about. It. Yes, of course, right. So we have some reactions, uh, as per usual. Oh, wait, yes, we have stuff from Jamie Alberding. Let's have a look now. I am really glad you've enjoyed watching and reacting to Star Trek CGI. Does this mean you want me to send more amazing videos like these in the future, as well as some of the Annex R productions of four years of war? Yeah, um, yes, whatever, yes, indeed. I have, I, I, I've always wanted to collect shattered glass action figures since Hasbro announced them in 2019. Oh yes, indeed. Oh, oh yeah, there, there's something I need to tell you. Yeah, I actually got a Lego Optimus Prime, which I built myself here. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll have a look at those. Um, I'll, have, I'll have a look at those. Um, those shattered glass figures myself, yes. Anyway, on to the reactions then. So, apparently, um, the video that is above this one that I'm currently looking at right now, uh, it's called That Mitchell and Web Look, That Quiz Podcast, made by Toby Dick or Critic uh, Yeah, apparently, I can't, uh, I, I don't know if I'll be able to react to it, uh, but uh, in, in this, uh, video, but I'll react to it. Uh, uh, I think it deserves its own video. Also, I'm a little bit worried about reacting to it because um, it, 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 it might be copyrighted, so I think, but, uh, uh, but uh, anyway, yes, I, I still think it deserves its own video. Anyway, without further ado, so we have this video, uh, which is um, once again from Lubicon Studio, where the, where the Transformers of all things, Battle Godzilla, isn't that exciting? Yes, um, yes, we well, have Optimus Prime battling Godzilla, apparently, for some reason, I have no idea why, but apparently, yes, this is once again made by Lumicon Studios, and let's see who's voicing Optimus. Oh, uh, yeah, 
Uh, oh, Orion Zacchus. Uh, uh, wait, Zacchus. I mean, Orion Zax. Why the heck did I say Zacchus? There's an, there's an OK. Anyway, yes. Uh, if you must say, yes, I have seen Orion Zax in, in a lot of YouTube Optimus Prime videos. Uh, I've actually seen this chap, but he's quite hilarious. He should continue uploading. Don't know why he stopped. Anyway, let's get, let, let's begin observing then. Okay, we got the snail again. Lumican. Oh great, this is an advertisement for Surfshark, isn't it? I don't want Surfshark. Let's skip that, thank you. Alright, who forgot to seal Grimlock's cage? Oh, this is definitely no Dinobot. It's way too big. Plus, I'm sure Drift's doing fine looking after them. Help me, Sensei! Well, if it's not the Dinobots, then what could that be? I don't Just know. Don't see what. Oh dear, well that's not well, good news. Oh, I guess I do see. You know what this is? No, I mean I'm seeing the giant foot that just landed in front of us. Do we go bang bang on the big old foot? Violence is not the only option, you know. Oh, we'll stop with all this nonsense. We gotta fight! Wait, stop! Aha, that's it! You're still on natural for explosions. I have found you idiot! So much more to learn from you as far as this function goes. Uh, Prime, uh, I'm with you, mate. Uh, I'm, I'm shaking your... Uh, I'm shaking my head as well. How in Cybertron's name... Do you think that... Uh oh it shouldn't Godzilla. That, you didn't tell me it was that Godzilla. You really pissed him off. This is gonna be fun. Oh, little food! What you shoot him? Little food! Are you okay? Well, there goes Hot Rod. See you later, Hot Rod. Oh my god, he's still alive! <laughs> Alive, but he's also okay. Yay! Primus, I thought we had finally got rid of him. Mm. Oh, this is what I call a foot missile. We must find out what this thing is and get it to scoot before it destroys the whole city. Prime. Yes. Megatron, I knew you were behind me. Oh, Autobots attack! Yeah. Ah. Sound waves just hooking, hooking the rampage. Stop! We have some explaining to do. Oh no, not this. Oh, go great, it's an advertisement. What a surprise. Why did you bring us all the way down here exactly? The real question is, what brought you down here? Shockwave! Shockwave! But I killed you with my own past violent hands. And hang on. Yeah, I still have to calibrate stuff as far as cloning goes. So what brought us down here, little man? Um, I don't know, logic or something like that? So, can't you tell us what's going on? Right, I was working on a new formidable weapon to use against you on a strap! Spoilers! 
An organism capable of evolving itself progressively, adapting to its surroundings very rapidly. He beat Radich in the leg. Yeah, I lost control of that thing after a few hours. It doesn't look like it wants to stop anytime soon. At this rate, there won't be anything left for me to rule over. Forget about taking over the Earth, you mega jack. We've got to stop this thing. The only way yes. would be to halt its evolution process. But my calculations are not complete. I don't know how. We will stop the time! I have a gun that can stop the time! <laughs> Yes, yes, yes I shall use your gun's technology and create a weapon big enough for this. Godzilla. That's the name? I don't know. Sounded cool. Boy, Shaggy. The sure is for- Yes. Go Godzilla, yes. Um, why would he want to create that? Very little left of those logic circuits in your yes. tiny body. Shut it! I am differently sized! He's tiny. Well, he that's is tiny. It. Tomorrow, we make our move. Yes! <laughs> Is the cannon ready? Why is Hot Rod just vomiting? Indeed! You have to get into position! We need a bait! Oh god, we're using Bumblebee as bait now? My goodness! Yes, your, your leadership qualities have surely skyrocketed. Closer, closer, closer! No, stop him! Yes, stop him! I like you, spirit, or your butt. How about we change your time with good old firepower? Seeker! <laughs> We must do something. I will do something. Oh boy. I will go inside the beast's mouth and shoot. Oh my God! Can you stop being French for one minute, Tom Rod? I can't stop it, Whip. Oh, that's a great idea. Do it now. If things go wrong, shoot a law. Um, it has been an honor, soldier. Same over here, mon chéri. <laughs> mon chéri. Stop talking French. Yes, stop talking French, Zotolo. What? What the heck? Oh my goodness, my my French translator inside my casing is playing up as usual. <laughs> Um, I can't, I can't, I can't speak French. Everyone attack the beast and make it fall. Yeah! 
over the quiet beaches of the island of Guadalcanal, Solomon Islands, on August the 21st, 1942. Okay. Hidden just within the tree line lie the men of the 1st Marine Division, hidden in their camouflaged positions along the banks of Alligator Creek. Inside one of the several foxholes, gunner Johnny the Indian Rivers, loader Al Schmidt, and ammo bearer Corporal Leroy Diamond fend off exhaustion. It's a tense night, none of the men speaking much. Command okay. has gotten wind of an incoming Japanese force, and their unit is on the front line. On the other side of the river, a storm is brewing. Over 900 men from the Japanese Imperial Army, under command of Colonel Kiyoneo Ichiki, stalk through the woods. Further up river, Rifleman Whitney Jacobs keeps an eye out from his position. He's uneasy. He can hear things out there. I say services sent during 1942, is it? The ruffling of leaves and light sloshing of water. He peeks into the creek and spots a Japanese soldier wading through. Also, this might be a long video, um, just so you know, uh, the darling cast I mean, but anyway. Without speaking a word, he lifts his rifle and fires a single shot. Back in the machine gun nest, the crack of a gunshot jolts the tiredness from the three soldiers. In a blur, more gunshots tear through the forest and screams fill the night. Dozens of Japanese soldiers burst out of the vegetation and charge across the creek, screaming murder. Johnny Rivers rushes for his weapon and opens fire. The entire line comes alight at once, unleashing all their might into the wave of charging men. Tracers light up the air, flying and ricocheting all over the place. 
Rivers keeps his hands on the trigger, dumping a never-ending barrage of 30 caliber bullets into the figures wading through the water. The screams change from incredible bravery to inexplicable pain. The ammunition runs out, and Schmidt jumps in to reload. A new box and bout at the ready. Another wave soon appears through the foliage. Rivers pulls the trigger the second they emerge, and bodies fall into the murky water, followed closely by their still living comrades. Ingeniously, the Japanese throw coconuts into the river. In the middle of the chaos, the floating spheres perfectly mimic the heads of swimming soldiers. Johnny desperately fires at them all. Bullets zip overhead and a rain of dirt and wood chips fall upon the soldiers, thrown into the air by the incessant barrage of bullets striking the earthworks. Rivers can hardly see anything, just shadows moving in the dark and muzzle flashes across the bank. Then a bright light illuminates the battlefield. A flare shines overhead, turning the darkness into daytime. The battle all but stops, frozen in time as the men from both sides don't dare move a muscle without the shield of the night. After what seems like an eternity, the flare burns out, and the tracers return. Everything is chaos. Rivers sees a dark, moving mass of men and opens fire. The men fall in droves, and survivors scatter into the woods. Explosions rock the earth, mortars and grenades rain down on both sides. Across the creek, the Japanese take over an abandoned American LVT. They set up a machine gun and take aim, their sights falling on Rivers' position. In the blink of an eye, a bullet strikes Johnny Rivers in the head, and the Indian of Pittsburgh is killed. Without time to mourn, Al Schmidt pushes Rivers' body off the weapon and takes his place, swiftly resuming his fallen friend's grim work. Oh dear, not this, not this. Oh, not another advertisement, go away. The attacking shadows, in the water, in the trees, on the beach, they're everywhere. He's cutting down man after man, but more take their place. <laughs> A bullet strikes the machine gun's mortar jacket and it sprays all over the foxhole. Schmidt falls back, quickly wiping away the boiling hot liquid before returning to his post. The weapon quickly overheats. Schmidt limits himself to short bursts, holding back the instinct to dump the bout down range. He keeps it up, holding the line while nursing his stricken weapon. But then he hears something hitting the earth to his left and everything goes white. A hand grenade has fallen right on top of them. Schmidt sees a flash, followed by nothing at all, while Diamond is struck on both his arms by shrapnel. Schmidt touches his face. He feels blood. They've got me in the eyes, he whispers to Diamond, still having the presence of mind not to alert the enemy. Diamond can't answer. His mouth is clamped shut by the pain. Completely blind, Schmidt unholsters his 45 caliber pistol. Clutching his bleeding arms, Diamond mutters, Don't do it, Schmidt. Don't shoot yourself. Fueled by sheer will, Schmidt replies, I'm not. I'm going to get the first Japanese that tries to come in here. Just tell me where he's coming from. They sit in position for a couple of eternal minutes, silent, listening to the death around them, wondering when their turn will come. Schmidt can't bear to do nothing and gets back on the machine gun. Still blind, he opens fire and sprays several bursts down the range, praying they'll hit anything. Diamond is shocked, but he isn't about to stop his friend. He crawls up beside him and sees the carnage ahead. The LVT that struck her is lays silent. The Japanese are top, taken out by a mortar strike. The fallen litter the scene, and down the creek, he spots an enemy soldier wading through the waters. Down left, he shouts. Schmidt swings the weapon around. He fires a handful of bursts in a general direction, and the enemy's hit. Diamond can barely believe his eyes. He spots another group of Japanese moving across the riverbank. Front, right! Schmidt pulls the trigger, several fall, and the rest scatter into the night. Then the gun clicks, out of ammunition. Schmidt, by pure memory, reaches over for a new box, 
puts it in place and reloads the machine gun. He resumes firing, determined to fight to the bitter end. Ah, oh, so this is where the whole blind machine gun thing comes into Outside play. of the foxhole, Whitney Jacobs, the man who fired the first shot, runs through the Japanese gunfire. Checking the status of their machine guns, he peers into Schmidt's emplacement and witnesses the carnage. He shouts at the pair, Don't shoot! I'll go for help! before running off. Jacobs returns to base and reports the situation to the lieutenant, who orders the two men to be relieved. A new gun and crew is sent to replace them, and a team of medics braves the lead to extract Schmidt and Diamond and River's body. Okay. With bullets zipping overhead, the medics drag all three of them into stretchers and pull them to safety. Schmidt is zoning out, unaware of how long it's been or how he got there, but with his 45 still in his hand. As they pass by the camp, he hears the voice of the lieutenant and holds out the gun and states, I guess I won't need this anymore, sir. The lieutenant takes the weapon and Schmidt passes out. The line successfully held against the Japanese onslaught, and the Marines would counter-attack on the early morning of the following day, wiping out the last of the Japanese forces okay. with an attack of light tanks. Excellent. With the American forces closing in, Colonel Kianeo Ichiki committed seppuku in the field. Uh, the scene yes, the following morning was one of utter devastation. Piles of enemy. Ah uh, yes, that's, that's, that's what people do when they fail, they... He littered the scene. Of the force of 900 Japanese, 777 would never rise again. 200 of those casualties lay around Schmidt's and River's machine gun. Al Schmidt would be taken back to the United States in a hospital ship. He endured several operations and regained partial eyesight in one eye. All three Marines would be awarded the Navy Cross for extraordinary heroism. Schmidt would also be commended by President Franklin D. Roosevelt and the Joint Chiefs of Staff for his actions. His heroism would be talked about extensively. A book was published and a film was made in 1945 called Pride of the Marines. Al Schmidt would retire and spend the rest of his days with his wife and son, visiting wounded veterans and becoming a skilled organ player in fishing. While Schmidt was hailed a hero publicly, Johnny, the Indian Rivers, faded into obscurity, but among the Marines, he was fondly remembered. Retired Marine Robert Leckie would write, The other guy was a hero, make no mistake about it, but some of us felt sad that the poor Indian got nothing. The Japanese supermen put bullets into the breast of the Indian, but he fired more than 200 rounds at them. How could the Marines forget the Indian? We hope in some small way that this video highlights his story. This video was inspired by the great book Voices of the Pacific by Adam Makos. We're very grateful to all the help Adam's given the channel over the years, and we definitely recommend getting a copy. Okay, so yeah, definitely recommend that. Anyway, yes, um, yeah, I enjoyed that. Anyway, it is time to move on then. Okay, so here are the rest of the videos. So this one is called Feathers of Air Combat, and I think this is set during the the um. Uh, the Second World War, I think. I think it is. I don't actually know, but apparently it's called The Fathers of Air Combat. Anyway, without further ado, viewers, let's begin observing it now. All credit go to Jan Herb. Let's continue. It's the 2nd of September 1916, over the battlefields of northern France. A British BE-2 light bomber makes its way over the front line, escorted by three DH-2 single-seater fighters. A pilot of one of the DH-2s takes a look below, witnessing the dreadful scar of no man's land, carving its way across the continent. Relegating his thoughts to the back of his mind, the pilot prepares to fulfill their mission when something prompts him to look up. Really? 
A grey bird emerges from the cloud above, coming down upon the formation. In the time before radios, he can't warn his fellows. The pilot bravely steers to meet his opponent's assault on his own. The two machines exchange a volley of gunfire across the heavens. The German aviator is forced to pull away from the DH-2's deadly barrage. The two become locked in combat as the rest of the British aircraft fly away, completely unaware of the battle. Below, soldiers can do nothing but watch the mesmerizing display. Two man-made warbirds clashing in a duel to the death. The skillful German evades all the fire and returns for home. But the British airmen won't let him go that easily. The very fast DH-2 chases after the nimble German fighter, pursuing the enemy beyond no man's land. Oh no, another advertisement. I don't care. Come on. The German pilot skillfully obeys the rain of lead headed his way. But the British fighter remains undeterred. He can feel the victory at his fingertips. But little does he know, he's playing right into the Germans' hands. Deep in enemy territory and led astray from his compatriots, his Lewis gun jams. Noticing the sudden end to the gunfire, the grey bird makes a loop in the air and pulls up behind the DH-2. His barrage is deadly and precise. The British pilot fights hard to evade, but there's nothing he can do. The engine is torn to pieces behind him, and the aircraft falls from the sky. The victorious pilot watches as his opponent makes a rough landing in the field below. He can't help but smirk, for he has just claimed his 20th victory. His name is Oswald Bolker. He became interested in flying from an early age and applied for aviation duty right away after joining the army. He impressed in his exam and successfully lobbied to be assigned alongside his brother, who had also become a pilot shortly before him. I say. On the 1st of September, the Bolka or Bolka air crew would take off for their first of many sorties. With Oswald at the controls, the duo proved a force to be reckoned with. The brothers flew more often and for longer than anyone else in the detachment, braving weather that no other crew dared. Their skills were quickly noticed, particularly on Oswald's. Meanwhile, at the Fokker factories, a new aircraft was rolling off the line. The Fokker E1 Eindecker, featuring one of the first gun synchronizers that allowed the machine guns to fire through the propellers. However, this aircraft proved very difficult to fly, so High Command decided that it would only be assigned to the very best pilots of the young Air Corps. Oswald would be chosen as one of those elites. He and the rest of the Eindecker pilots were given a very quick introduction to the aircraft before they were sent out on their first missions. In August 1915, Volker ambushed a British observation biplane. He swept in from behind and opened fire. His shocked opponent attempted to flee, but Volker was too close to miss. He chased after the British aircraft, firing away until a volley struck the engine and it seized in the air. Ever chivalrous, Volker ceased his assault and the British pilot made an emergency landing inside Allied lines. Good Lord. It was his first victory in a single-seater and the start of a legend. The victories wrapped up for fast, for Bolka and for the entire Eindecker forces, and their fame grew to match. Soon, he couldn't go anywhere without civilians and soldiers gathering to meet him. It was this fame that brought about a particular incident on the 1st of October 1915. Volker was on a train to a new post when he was approached by a then unknown struggling pilot by the name of Manfred von Richthofen. Just a year younger than Volker, he quickly struck a conversation, heading straight to the point of aerial combat, and more specifically, how to be good at it. With, with four victories under his belt, Volker was still evolving his tactics, so he couldn't give any advice beyond aim well. Still, Richthofen made a good impression on Volker, and the two remained in touch. In the air, Volker's victories kept racking up. 
Trading the title of the deadliest ace in the world back and forth with his friend, Max Immelman. Both of their twin tallies rocketed into double digits. They were both awarded the Blue Max. But the ace race would have an abrupt end when Immelman was killed in a dogfight in mid-June 1916. The news shocked the nation, and the German government grounded Volker, fearful to lose their second great ace shortly after the other. By this time, Volker had 19 victories under his belt. With this experience, he would put pen to paper and write what he considered to be the most fundamental rules of air combat, named the Dicta Volker. Try to secure advantages before attacking. If possible, keep the sun behind you. Always carry through an attack when you've started it. Fire only at close range, and only when your opponent is properly in your sights. Always keep your eye on your opponent, and never let yourself be deceived by ruses. In any form of attack, it's essential to assail your enemy from behind. If your opponent dives on you, do not try to evade his onslaught, but fly to meet it. When over the enemy's lines, never forget your own line of retreat. For the squadron, attack on principle in groups of four or six. When the fight breaks up into a series of single combats, take care that several don't go for the same opponent. Yes, maybe I should try that with my Dardic Fleets when I'm invading. These would go on to form the groundwork of dogfight strategy throughout both world wars and earn him the nickname, the father of air combat. He spent over a month grounded, but his skills were far from forgotten. With the war intensifying, the government brought Volker back into the fray, and he was given a command of a new squadron, the Jagdstaffel II. Volker took up the position eagerly, using his fame to recruit the most promising talent, among them a certain Manfred von Richthofen. He would teach everything he knew to the pilots of the Yasta, especially the Dicta Volker, and success quickly materialized. In just two and a half months of existence, the squadron claimed 50 victories with only six casualties. A large part of those victories were contributed by Richthofen, the man he had met in passing on a train, who proved himself to be one of Volker's most skilled pupils, and would later go on to immortalize his name in the pages of history as the Red Baron. Hey, that was him! Volker. This guy's the Red Baron, really. The South would see his personal number of victories to double, reaching 40 by the end of October 1916. The Yasta grew a reputation, and the members became tight-knit. Volker taught by example, instilling respect, and developing a... Yes, I've heard of a Red Baron, but never actually learnt about him. ...friendship with all of his men. On the 28th of October, 1916, Volker and five of his best pilots threw themselves into a dogfight against a pair of British fighters. In the chaos, Volker and his best friend, Erwin Baum, chased after the same target in breach of his own dicta. The two flew close to each other, but had the awareness to give space. As they're pursuing, they don't notice the second enemy comes in from the side and cuts across their nose. Yeah, I was wondering, um, in, um... In, uh, like the wacky races, I was thinking... Isn't, like, um... Dastardly inspired from the Red Baron? Both evade the last second, with Boom dodging upwards and Volker downwards. But in the process, the pair lose sight of each other. Blocked by his own wings, Boom is unable to see Volker coming up from underneath him. The two realize at the last moment and try to pull away, but it's too late.
From, from a distance, distance the, red the Red Baron watches as the tip of Walker's wing hits the underside of Burma's aircraft and its fragile cloth covering rips. Initially, the two aircraft separate well, but the wind rips a tear on Walker's wing ever wider. He wrestles for control as his wing shreds off, but when it's inevitable, the aircraft enters an unrecoverable spin. Oh, no. Richtofen follows his mentor and friend all the way down until he crashes into the earth. A, a continent mourned his passing. A funeral procession brought his coffin to his home city of Dessau, where he would be put to rest. Today, a grand monument stands atop his grave, fitting of his legacy. Two days after the funeral, a lone British fighter would fly over the German lines and drop a wreath. With it was a note that read, From the English Air Corps to the officers of the German Air Corps, we hope that you will find this wreath. We sympathize with his relatives and friends, and we pay tribute to his bravery. In commemoration of Captain Borka, our brave and chivalrous opponent. If, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the channel and please watch more videos of ours. Thank you. That was good. I like that. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jan. But now we are watching a bunt two. We have two. No, we have a video from History Matters now called Why Did the British Royal Family Change Its Name? to Windsor. Right, so this was made by History Matters, and there's an ad playing again. Why? Yeah, this is explaining about why they changed their royal family name to Windsor. Yes, and this was made um, about six days ago, or could I go to History Matters? And without further ado, let's begin. 1914, when Europe got a bit worse, the British royal family, headed by King George V of the House of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha, opted to change its name. This change saw the British royal house become that of the House of Windsor. This change of name wasn't so clear-cut and many others were put forth, which raises the question, why did the British royal family change? its name, and why did it change its name to Windsor specifically? So, as many of you will know, after World War I kicked off, the British public weren't exactly in a pro-German mood. And as the war continued, this dislike of all things German grew. And given that the British royal family had been German since the Hanoverian dynasty took the throne in 1714, there were some in government that were worried that anti-German sentiment would soon become anti-monarchy sentiment, which was a fair concern since Britain's first sea lord, the Austrian Prince Louis of Battenberg, was forced to resign when the war kicked off. In 1917, after the Russian Emperor was made unemployed, British Prime Minister David Lloyd George urged the King to... Yes, made unemployed. And I think Rasputin was behind it, yes. Also, if you must know, if you may recall, Rasputin was, in fact, the master. So, the master forced King... Um, forced the Russian monarchy to abdicate and basically caused the whole... Um, caused the movie Anastasia to happen. ...to do two things. One, One renounce his German and Austrian... And yes, I have seen the Don Bluth movie, Anastasia. It is a very, very good movie. Uh, I would... I would really, um... consider you... people... you viewers to watch it. It's really good. ...and two, change the family name to something more British. The king didn't want to do this because royal houses weren't something that you would traditionally rename on a whim. But he didn't want to get himself Sard, so he reluctantly agreed. King George personally wanted to take the name Stuart, to emphasise continuity with the last non-German royal house. Lloyd George said no, because picking the name of a house that was overthrown, and also one whose descendants pressed their claim on the throne during times of war, was a bad look. As such, Lloyd George called up all of the previous living
asking Liberal Prime Ministers to come up with a new name to get the King to agree. The first was Tudor, which was vetoed by the King since he felt that it was associated with head slicing, religious turmoil and despotism. Plantagenet was rejected for being too French, whereas York and Lancaster were denied because of their association with civil war and insecure rule. So why was Windsor put forward? Well, the name was chosen by the King's private secretary, Lord Arthur Stamfordham. Whilst he and the royal family were staying at Windsor Castle, Stamfordham realised that Windsor was a suitable name for these reasons. First, Windsor Castle had been in the possession of the English and later British royal families for about 700 years at this point. Second, it was also a title of Edward III, who did the most British thing of all. He invaded France. And third, Windsor was an entirely British place with no negative connotations. Lloyd George agreed, and with a bit of encouragement, so did the King. He signed a proclamation declaring that the royal family had adopted the name Windsor and the royal family had renounced their German titles and awards, which, for the British people, politicians and newspapers, was enough to convince them that the royal family was no longer German, but was instead a now fundamentally British institution. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and a special thanks to my patrons, James Isanet, Kelly Moneymaker, Sky Chappelle, Porsche... That was good. Oh, okay, so we have this video, which was made by Kaiser Cat Cinema, and this is basically a what-if scenario called What If. What if the Germans won World War One? A Kaiserreich universe documentary. So, without further ado, viewers, let us begin observing it then. <laughs> As German troops marched through Paris, the guns on the Western Front had finally fallen silent. The horrors of the Great War, which claimed over 30 million lives and wrought havoc upon all of Europe, had ended. The German Empire had triumphed utterly. That morning, the world awoke to a new age. The age of the Kaiserreich. The Kaiserreich. January 1917. Wilhelm II, Kaiser of the German Empire, holds a council with his military advisers. These councils are regular, but this one will bring about a decision that changes the course of the war. High-ranking military officials, including the head of the Imperial Naval Office, von Capell, join Chancellor von Bethmann Hollweg in urging the Kaiser not to resume unrestricted submarine warfare in the Atlantic Ocean, fearing the inevitable attacks on American shipping will draw the United States into the war on the Allied side. The opponents of unrestricted submarine warfare brace themselves for defeat when Eric Ludendorff argues in the strongest possible terms that unrestricted submarine warfare should be resumed. The previous year, this Prussian son of minor nobility had been raised to the rank of General Quartiermeister, 
a new role placing him in command of the German army's logistics and supply. In reality, the role was far more powerful, and Ludendorff was on track to become de facto dictator of all things military. In a duumvirate with chief of the German general staff, Paul von Hindenburg. Ah yes, Paul von Hindenburg, yes. I know exactly who that is. He's the one who made the Hindenburg, which was a large blimp. Perhaps this obvious desire for power that made the Kaiser wary of increasing Ludendorff's influence further. Had he been given the apparent authority to override the German Navy's own wishes, there would have been little standing in the way of his and Hindenburg's total dominance of the German state. Wilhelm, really? seeing this, decides to act. After no more than a few minutes, the die is cast. The Kaiser has decided against resuming unrestricted submarine warfare. The decision will only delay, not prevent, the rise of Ludendorff and Hindenburg to supreme authority within the Empire. But while it sacrifices the chance to starve Britain out of the war, it near eliminates the risk of the United States declaring war on Germany herself. The United States must be neutral in fact as well as in name during these days that are to try men's souls. We must be impartial in thought as well as in action, must put a curb upon our sentiments as well as upon every transaction that might be construed as a preference of one party to the struggle before another. Woodrow Wilson, 28th President of the United States. Wilson spoke for many Americans who wanted the United States to stay out of any conflict. But there was a darker and deeper reason behind U.S. non-interventionism. As early as the mobilization of 1914, agents of the Abteilung 3B, German's elusive spy agency, had been infiltrating the highest rungs of U.S. political life. Moving through the swathes of German expats and immigrants on the Northeast, their single aim was to keep the U.S. from intervening in any European war. This would buy the Kaiserreich the time to make a decisive strike against the Allies and claim her hegemony over the continent. Had the German Navy returned to unrestricted submarine warfare and claimed countless American lives, the Abwehr's efforts might have been in vain. But with no pressing need to side against Germany, proponents of American neutrality maintained control of Congress. President Wilson, re-elected in 1916 with the slogan of he kept us out of war, was all too willing to steer clear of foreign entanglements. Okay. Oh, oh, oh dear. Um, another advertisement. 17 was a turning point in the war diplomatically, but also militarily. After three years of war, cracks had begun to show in the determination of Allied forces. Heavy French casualties at Chemin de Dam led to widespread mutiny among French troops. This disaster discourages the French high command from continuing great offensives until the end of the year, giving Germany a chance to recover from the unmitigated catastrophe of the Brusilov offensive in the east. Okay. With both sides suffering more than a million casualties, the aftermath of the stunning and forward-looking offensive masterminded by General Brusilov was a pause in the Russian advance. The motherland simply had no further reinforcements to send, and further attacks were out of the question. The Central Powers, meanwhile, had taken careful note of the devastating use of carefully targeted artillery and small unit tactics with which Brusilov had found success. It was an approach which would now be turned against a Russian army which had exhausted itself. But even if German and Austro-Hungarian forces had not been preparing an assault, the Russian Empire's time was running out. A peasantry and working class furious about looming famine, military incompetence and a lack of compassion turned their ire on Tsar Nicholas II, 
After riots, mass mutiny, and rebellion, the Tsar abdicates in March of 1917. A provisional government is formed under the brilliant lawyer Alexander Kerensky, but the young man's unstable reign is quickly snatched away by a new emerging faction, the feared Russian Bolsheviks, led by the enigmatic Vladimir Lenin. As the old guard of the Russian Empire and Kerensky's democratic forces form an unlikely alliance against the Red Menace, it is not long before the broiling conflict erupts in open war. The First Russian Civil War has begun. In Berlin, the news is met with delight. The Kaiser's decision to secretly assist Lenin's return to Russia has paid off, and the bear to the east is mortally wounded. Offensives drive deep into Russia, and in March 1918, Germany signs the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with the secretly established Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. Swathes of land okay. that once belonged to the Tsar now answer to the Kaiser and to the Austrian Emperor. Hello, in Vienna, news. 1918 brings more for Emperor Karl to celebrate. The stalemate of inconclusive and bloody battles along the Isonzo River comes to an end with the Caporetto Offensive, beating the humiliated Italian army back to the Piave River. Only a heroic last-minute defense prevents the Austrians from taking Venice, and when the front line has settled, the Habsburg Emperor's armies are poised and ready for a fateful push into the Italian heartland. Oh dear. Success for the Central Powers is not universal. The Ottoman Empire, long derided as the sick man of Europe, proves incurable. After a series of devastating raids and attacks by the dashing Lawrence of Arabia across 1917, the Sultan slowly loses control of his precious railways, lifelines to Ottoman frontline soldiers. Chronically undersupplied and outmatched by Allied and rebel Arab infantry, the Ottoman army loses Baghdad and Jerusalem to British forces. Celebrations in London are short-lived. In December 1917, another blow to Allied morale brings a death knell for their relationship with the United States. On a routine patrol, a British submarine mistakenly torpedoes an American freighter carrying Christmas gifts to Germany, killing several U.S. citizens. Seizing their opportunity, pro-German politicians in the United States move swiftly. Urging support for the Central Powers, the backlash they whip up forces Britain into a partial opening of the blockade, averting the looming spectre of famine in Central Europe. The opening of the blockade, combined with the relief of winning the war in the East, rallied German forces and set off a series of cascading events that would eventually spell doom for the beleaguered allies on the Western Front. With Germany focused on the East in the first half of 1980, the British and French realized that with American support no longer a reasonable expectation, the time to strike is now. At this stage in the war, the sides still seemed relatively even matched, an assumption shattered by the outcome of the Allied Great Spring Offensive. After three months of fighting, not one of its objectives had been met, and an irrecoverable 800,000 casualties had been suffered by the Allies. The capitulation of Greece to Field Marshal Erich von Falkenhayn a month later buoyed German spirits further. With Russia eliminated and the Allies exhausted in the West, Germany has decisively claimed the initiative in the war. It is up to her to determine how to use it. She would do so in 1919. After spending the second half of 1918 biding time and redeploying forces from the Eastern Front, the German High Command begins its own great offensive, masterminded by Ludendorff. So-called infiltration tactics prove devastatingly effective, and the crucial railway hub of Amiens 
of the Allied headquarters falls to Germany on the 26th of March. Oh the British and French forces are now unable to supply one another, and even communication becomes difficult. On the 31st of May, the first short-distance artillery shots hit the capital, starting the siege of Paris. Ferdinand Koch is dismissed as Supreme French Commander and replaced with Philippe Tétain. A final blow is not yet delivered. The long-awaited Austrian offensive to knock Italy out of the war has stalled, and German forces are diverted to the southern front. While they will find success, Tétain and the defenders of France are granted a short operational respite. The British Army uses this time to attempt a fighting retreat to the Channel Coast, hoping to withdraw safely to the United Kingdom. The Entente Cordiale is crumbling. As the hungry citizens of Paris begin to man the barricades once more, the desperate French leadership gambles everything on a counter-breakthrough in the Oise region. Miraculously, French tanks and cavalry divisions punch through the German lines, offering tantalizing hope. The lasting impact, however, is simply to delude the French high command that a further offensive would have the same success. Oh, oh dear, another advertisement, great. I like advertisements, no I don't, what am I talking about? As she throws all remaining resources into an attempt to link up with the isolated British forces near the coast, France's luck finally runs out. The rear of the front collapses in the face of a German counterattack. It felt like their great offensive had come again, and soon we had no more shells to fire back. Unnamed French soldier, 1919. There are no more supplies coming. Unrest and rebellion in French cities has slowed war production to a crawl. Pétain advises against surrender, but the matter is taken out of his hands by the French army's old enemy, Newton. With her army crippled, and with no other options, France requests an armistice with the German Empire. On the 4th of October, it is signed. Both sides hurry through negotiations. One condition is that on the 6th of October, the German army's victory will become unambiguous with a march through Paris itself. Gefreiter Andreas Koch watches from the Eiffel Tower as he and his men raise the flag of the empire that now unquestionably dominates mainland Europe. The Treaty of Versailles is signed a month later, punishing and humiliating the fragile provisional French government. Its people are still up in arms. The Third Republic was born with revolutionaries in Paris and German armies victorious on its soil. It dies in much the same fashion. From Dunkirk to the Dnieper River, the guns have fallen silent on a new German continent. However, just across the channel, an allied power remains. The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, still confident in the might of her Royal Navy, refuses to come to terms. The stage is set for the Second Battle of Jutland, and the war seems far from over. To be well, that was, that was very good, very good story, I liked it, but now it is time to have a look at Ghost Godzilla, which is a stop motion animation made by Conzilla, all credit will go to Conzilla of course, I've no idea what Ghost Godzilla is, I know what Godzilla is, but I haven't seen him as a ghost. Oh, it says it in here. <coughs> After a nuclear test was conducted at the same site where the original Godzilla was mutated, a monster soul is able to haunt a radioactive fallout once again unleash the power into the cities of the world. Let's observe now, or could it go to Godzilla? Why is he called Godzilla? Thank mm -hmm. you.
Uh, tell me in the comments below, because I don't know. Grenades against Godzilla, but which Godzilla toy is that? I think it's because it sh is uh, the original, but show of Godzilla was cancelled and replaced with the Heisei Godzilla. Yeah, maybe that's what's going on here. That's that it. Okay, so that was, uh, so those are the videos. My goodness, how long was this? How long was this video again? I don't know. Anyway, let's end this now. So anyway, my fellow subjects, if you enjoyed this, remember to subscribe for more, and I'll see you all in the next video then. Goodbye. Thanks all for the enjoyable videos. <laughs>